now going to shift gears to uh, our first panel. Uh, this has been a terrific opportunity. I should say, if you don't know, I'm Lawrence McDonald. I lead the communications and policy outreach work here. And I probably know less about the measurement of inequality than half the people in this room. But I know twice as much as I knew about a week ago. And uh, I credit that to uh, my colleagues, uh, Nora and Alex, who've been teaching me about it. And uh, I was very impressed by the panel that we have. Um, I've asked our panelists, and they have generously agreed to um, compact what they have to say into seven minutes each. So uh, I'm going to begin with Nancy. As you know, she's the president of the Center for Global Development. Uh, Nancy, I had the good fortune to meet you when you were uh, the director of the research department at the World Bank and uh, delighted to have rejoined you here at CGD. Um, without further ado, um, Nancy, the floor is yours. Yes. yes. Yeah. If, if you're more comfortable speaking from the podium, everybody should feel free to do that. Yes, I can see. Thank you, Lawrence. I forgot to thank Lawrence. You know, there are many, um, many people who contributed in making this work. Lawrence, Alex, and Nora especially. Now I want to thank my co-author, Christian uh, Mayer, who's full co-author and is here to answer questions following <laughs> our discussion. Uh, he knows the math better than I do, but you won't hear about the math right now. So what I'd like you to do is ask yourselves, what do you think is your daily consumption in dollars? in the last year. And then ask yourself, what do you think in India at the median of the distribution, the person in the middle between the top and the bottom, what is her daily consumption in absolute dollars? I'm going to be arguing that the median is a good idea. It has a lot of messages. And I'm going to lean on three points, simplicity, durability, and as a broad indicator of development progress. And I'll try to go back to that at the end of my seven minutes. So let me start. We have two, I have two slides uh, by explaining this figure. Uh, you see on the vertical axis, axis, the survey median consumption daily per capita in about the latest year available measured in 2005 uh, purchasing power parity terms. So you can see that, you know, a, the low in the countries are the bubbles and the size of the bubble indicates something about the proportion at the, I forget what it is, the poverty rate. So Bangladesh is a very poor country where measured median consumption per capita is between one and two dollars. It's about a dollar and a quarter. And uh, you see on the vertical axis that it, on the horizontal axis, that its gross national income per capita is something like three hundred dollars. Okay, so that's that's what this figure is there. Now there are three points that I want to make about this figure. Also, you see. The, po the international poverty line for moderate poverty of $2 a day, and our estimate of the developing country median. If you group all the developing countries and line up all the people in them, median consumption, measured consumption per capita is about $3 a day. So there's a lot going on in this picture, but um, it's not that complicated low-income countries, lower middle income, and upper middle income. So three points about this picture. The first is that most people in the developing world are really very poor. As Rebecca indicated, there may be a lot of people in many countries now above the poverty line. I don't know what you think your median consumption is per day, but in this room, it is for the youngest, poorest, maybe $50. And for the oldest, richest, two to three times that. So we are talking about a lot of, by any 
everyday measure poor people out there. That's the first message. The second message is that for the poorest countries in the world that are grouped down here in the um, southwest corner, median consumption per capita actually conveys a lot of information about the poverty rate and the poverty gap. Because in most of those countries, most peop half of the population, at least, is under $2. You can see from the, there, because the median consumption is below $2. And you get a feel for the poverty gap depending on how far below $2 is median consumption. So it tells us a lot about poverty. And I would argue in a somewhat more intuitive way for, a large, for the larger public. The third message is that median consumption per capita is a far better indicator of material well-being for the typical person in a country than is GNI per capita or GDP per capita. That point will be familiar to most people in the room. It follows that the median is usually going to be better than the mean because in most countries there's some skewness in the distribution of income and the mean will be higher than the median. Still, the reality is that for most people in the world, including many people who read the World Deve Development Indicators, what they understand is GDP per capita as a crude measure of well-being for people in a particular country. What this picture shows you is that Iran has median consumption per capita of $5 at about $2,800 GNI. Swaziland, at the same GNI per capita, has median consumption of less than $2. There's something there about the difference between Iran and Swaziland for most people. GNI per capita in China, GNI is $10. The median consumption measured in rural China is $2. Mexico, mean GNI per, mean GNI per capita is $20. The median is about $7 as measured. OK, so that's the first picture. Two more minutes, great. This is a s apparently somewhat more complicated picture that Christian designed. <laughs> and it's excellent. It tells us a lot. It tells us who benefited from growth in these two countries in the period 1995 to 2010. OK, so if you just look at South Africa, it shows you that at the, say, 20th percentile of the population, in that entire period, growth, their growth in income of those in the beginning and at the end, the growth in income of that group, was about 1% a year that the growth at, at, me, at the median was about 2% a year, that the change in GNI was over 3%, and the change in the mean was more over 3%. Growth in South Africa in that period was disequalizing. In the picture, the picture of Mexico shows you the opposite. You can see that the change, of G, the change in the growth for those at the median was about just under 2% and at the mean under 1%. Nora Lustig is sitting here. She did the uh, uh, very important work showing that in many countries of Latin America, including Mexico, growth fell. So let me close by going back to the three points that I made. First, the median has an advantage of simplicity and accessibility in several respects. For understanding well-being of the typical person, if combined with some measure of average GDP per capita or average GNI, it gives you a sense of what's happening on the distribution. And for understanding who's benefited from growth over a long period of time. That's the simplicity and accessibility argument. The durability argument Rebecca referred to, as more countries reduce poverty, in their minds, you know, at na the national level, the question of what happens to the typical person will become more important. 
and relative poverty, as we talk about more in the paper, will emerge. Uh, and even uh, Martin Ravalian, who is a sort of guru of absolute poverty measures, has been writing recently about relative poverty. And finally, I want to say, I didn't really make this point, that the median provides a broader indicator of overall development progress, including state building, the building of social capital, whether things are working in general uh, beyond any measure of poverty and poverty gaps, and certainly beyond the simple, most accessible measure people are familiar with based on national accounts aggregates. Thanks, Laura. <coughs> Thank, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, I want to say that there is a bit of a method to the madness of the panel. You will have, have observed that people are speaking in alphabetical order. That's actually a coincidence because they're also speaking in the order of from the sort of simplest, most obvious or intuitive measure, I should say, to increasing complexities. And we've called the panel the ins and outs of measurement of poverty. We heard from Rebecca some of the political issues of measurement. One of the reasons I understand that the high-level panel decided not to have an inequality indicator was some concern about what it would actually be. That's the broad question we're asking today. And we're starting with Nancy's proposal for something that is really simple and intuitive. And now we're moving to um, Alex Cobham, my colleague. He is a research fellow with CGD based at our European office in London. And uh, Alex is a bit of an odd duck in that he has had a research uh, career almost entirely within advocacy NGOs, but um, he wasn't really a good fit there. So now he's come to Perch in a think tank, and we're, we're delighted to have him. He was also a member of the advisory group on the consultation, uh, the UN consultation around the inequality goal, about which we'll be hearing some more in, uh, from some of our other speakers in the second panel. Um, Alex, over to you. Um, thank you very much, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we... It's possible I'm in the wrong order here, because what I'm going to propose is uh, uh, potentially even simpler than the, the median. Um, uh, and this is a bit of work with uh, Andy Sumner from King's College, um, uh, based on uh, some findings from Gabriel Palma. Um, I'm going to run, run through things. I'm going to make three, three points, really. The first is that if there is to be an inequality indicator, um, never mind a target or a goal, and certainly if there's that, in post-2015, it needs to be intuitively clear. Um, it needs to be the basis for holding governments to account, um, not only for uh, uh, some measurement exercise. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the fact that inequality, as we see it, in uh, income at least, is largely in the tails. And what that means is that a measure that's overly sensitive to the middle of the distribution, such as the Gini, is clearly inappropriate. Um, but thirdly, I'm going to talk about another reason why the genie doesn't do quite what you think and why, therefore, you might want to um, consider the, the Palmer as a measure. Um, all right, uh, pop quiz. Imagine for a moment that X and Y are two points in the income distribution, uh, and you have a choice between uh, these two summary measures. The first is a ratio of one of these points to the other point. And the second is uh, this uh, horrible thing at the bottom. Um, <laughs> you'll notice these are called P and G, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll come back to them. But you may, you may have a guess at what these actually are uh, already. Um, the Palmer uh, ratio is the ratio of income shares of the top 10% to the bottom 40%. So what it tells you, um, when it's one, effectively each person in the top 10% of the income distribution has four times the income of a person in the bottom 40%. Um, and what you see is at the low end, one is, is round about where you get. Some countries are a bit below uh, one. At the top end, where the genie is bounded at one, the palm is unbounded. So it can, in theory, become uh, any, uh, any value. Um, the reason for taking this particular ratio is, as I said, based on the work of Gabrielle Palmer. And what Gabrielle found is that the income deciles from five to nine, what he calls the middle 50%, the bit that's missed out in the Palmer, is uh, remarkably stable. It has an income share across countries at all sorts of different income levels that's about 50% or slightly higher. It really doesn't vary a great deal over time, nothing like 
the, how much variation there is in either the share of the top 10% or the bottom 40%. And where we have the data to track through the changes from taxation and from transfers, what we find again is that that middle 50% income share just doesn't move very much. Most of distribution, and in a sense most of the politics of distribution, is about what's happening between the top 10% and the bottom 40%. And that's why you know, we think that you should, uh, you should focus on this. OK, um, to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, here's the palm and the genie for a set of countries from our um, sample. This is from the POVCAL data from the World Bank. What you see, if you look at the bottom three, the, the least uh, unequal countries, um, as I say, the palm is around about one, sometimes a bit lower, uh, and the genie is somewhere between 0.25 and 0.3. Um, now, what you get uh, there is a reasonable amount of movement in both the Palma and the Gini um, as, uh, as things change. If you look at the top end, what's quite striking is the difference between how much the Palma is moving, how much this ratio of the top 10% to the bottom 40% is moving from round about 7 to round about 14, 15. Whereas looking at the Gini, it's barely moving. Now, what this is about um, is the Gini being... Well, it's a couple of things, but one important thing is the Gini being relatively insensitive to the extremes of the distribution, although as I'm going to come back to in practice, that's not quite uh, how it works. So what you get is a lot of movement in the Gini when you're at lower levels of inequality, but as you get to higher levels, where in a sense we might be more worried about the inequality, the Gini stops moving nearly as much and doesn't really tell you so much about what's actually happening there, whereas as you see, the Palma um, shows that that ratio uh, moving very, very strongly. Uh, incidentally, this data here for Jamaica is almost certainly in error. This is from POVCAL, as I say, and the World Bank has the bottom 10% in Jamaica having 0% of income, um, indeed 0.00, .00, which seems somewhat unlikely. Um, all right, let me uh, get on to a problem in practice. When we looked at the Gini, you know, there's a criticism of the Palma that it ignores half the distribution. And, you know, there are reasons to ignore that half. It doesn't move that much, but it's a fair, it's a fair point. So we had a look at the genie to see how much of the genie we could explain by just taking those same two components, the top 10% share of income and the bottom 40%. Uh, and we did it both for the POVCAL data and the, the other big uh, distributional data source, the UN uh, wider um, data set. The only important line here is the one at the bottom. That is um, how much we can explain of the variation in the Gini by only using these two components. In other words, the two components that perfectly, by construction, define the Palma are also capable of perfectly explaining the Gini in the two main data sets that anyone uh, uses to look at distribution. So back to that pop quiz, which of these measures do you prefer? One that does what it says on the tin, where you can see precisely um, what is, being, uh, what is being measured, or one which is in fact a much more complicated and untransparent use of the same two points of the distribution. It feels to me fairly clear what the answer is, but one thing I think we, both Andy and I would say is there is a problem you can see in distributional data, which uh, you could think of as the tyranny of the genie. We've become quite accustomed to using the genie ahead of anything else to measure inequality. So often in POVCAL, what you see is data that's really not capturing the full distribution. It's only perhaps the main points of the, the quintiles, let's say, being used to construct a synthetic Lorenz curve in order to generate a genie, because that's the way that we talk about inequality. Now, if we didn't have that fixation, I think we wouldn't do that, and perhaps some of these findings wouldn't be quite so, so clear as they are. The genie would actually capture more information uh, than the ones that we're using do. So we wouldn't want to argue for the Palma to replace, uh, you know, a, a tyranny of the Palma instead. I think what this supports is an idea, which I think this, this panel is also evidence of, that we should be thinking about a set of um, complementary measures rather than saying, here's the one, this is it. Um, but if we're going to say there's one, please let it not be the genie. All right, thank you. <laughs> ah. <clears throat> Uh, Alex, thank you very much. Uh, for those who are still here at the end, we're going to have a show of hands and see who wants to uh, stand up and defend the genie against these uh, competing measures. Um, our next uh, speaker is James Foster. 
Uh, James is a professor of e economics and international affairs at George Washington University. Um, I learned that uh, he is the author of something called the FGT Index, which has been used in thousands of studies and uh, news to me, but certainly not to people who know it well, was the basis for targeting in uh, Progressa and Opportunidades, which we're also going to hear about more later in the day. And um, also, James is the author of this terrific new book, A Unified Approach to Measuring Poverty and Inequality. Um, I told James I tried to read it last night. It's clearly not for me. But if you are a number cruncher, it's definitely for you, because I understand if you read this book, you will know how to construct all kinds of measures of inequality and poverty. So I recommend it highly if that's the kind of thing that you want to do. James, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. And I'm watching yours as it uh, times me out. How about that? Great. Uh, good to be here. I'm going to present, in fact, something a bit broader than what we've been seeing, uh, it, talking about various different ways of looking at inequality, but within the same framework, so that you can link things that people ordinarily cannot link. So the income distribution is made up of three aspects, size, spread, base. Base being poverty, spread, inequality, size being size. Um, if you look at all of these, they find their basis in something I've called an income standard. It's like the equivalent, equally distributed equivalent measure of Atkinson. It's a summarizing of the entire distribution in one number. Okay, And this is like the mean, the median, the mean of the lower 40%, the so-called sen mean, the geometric mean, I won't define those last two. And inequality measures, it so happens, every single one of them virtually is made up of two of these things, two income standards compared one against the other to see how inequality is tracking. So it's like as if you have one out of your left eye, which looks at the lower incomes, one out of the right eye that looks at the higher incomes, and you're looking at how far those representative incomes are apart. So this is all presented in this. We've been thinking about this for years and finally wrote it up in this, uh, this book. Uh, inequality, per se, then, can be measured using a type of index, like looks like Atkinson, doesn't it, where you take a higher uh, income standard, subtract a lower income standard, and put it over the higher income standard. And there could be other transformations. We've seen tons of different transformations. There's no one exact one, it's just the, the main point I'm presenting to you is these two standards within each inequality measure. Usually, mind you, the higher one is the mean income, and the lower one is some bottom-sensitive indicator. And then inequality has this look, mean minus this bottom-sensitive income standard over the mean. Now, what's nice about this is that you can actually twist that around and review the lower income standard as if it's an inequality adjusted mean. So you take the mean and you multiply it times 1 minus the genie, let's say. And that is, oh, sends measure of welfare. So this interpretation allows you to see that you're incorporating inequality but not washing out the mean effect, which is quite important. So in the example that Nancy was talking about, the median, it can be seen this way as a inequality adjusted uh, income standard, uh, inequality adjusted mean, because by taking a measure of skewness, which incorporates the mean and the median, as I, you can see it in this direction. That's what you were referring to the end. The World Bank's new indicator, which is looking at the lowest, the mean of the lowest 40%, uh, can likewise be looked at in that respect, because it's an indicator, uh, an income standard that is part and parcel of the Palma. In fact, one might argue that it is the Palma. You dump the second part, it's kind of redundant. If that part in the middle is fixed and isn't going to change, then once you know the mean of the lowest 40%, you're home free. The Sen uh, comes from the Gini in this direction. And the geometric mean comes from an Atkinson measure in this way. So the interpretation of these income standards as containing inequality, a trade-off between mean and inequality, is really quite forceful. So you can track inequality quite directly by looking at how fast, as we saw on the slide just a second ago, how fast one of these is growing as compared to the other, the median versus the mean. If the median is growing slower, then inequality is rising by the representative measure of inequality. Likewise with the Gini, sends versus the mean. Which one's growing faster? So um, there are two ways that inequality could be tracking differently for different measures, one of which is substantially the lower income standard. The different income standards implicit 
in inequality measures is what drives a lot of the movement differences. But cardinal differences are also, also presented by the transformation, the which way do you do it, if you do it like the PAMA does with the higher over the lower, or whether you do the separate uh, difference from a higher to a lower. So should we have relative inequality targets? That's the question. And I just wanted to put it in a very straightforward manner. Yes, if you think it's good to burn rich incomes. So you're going to face that problem every time that you put a relative inequality as a target. And I think that there's not going to be a lot of universal agreement on that. However, there could be a, a good argument for looking at this kind of indicator, which incorporates both does not leave out inequality, but does not leave out also the mean, which is all important. Now, the same framework, uh, by the way, which one is the big question we'll get to. We've had some discussions about the median over at the bank, of course, discussions about the lower uh, 40 mean. Those are good, simple ones that people can really get. Of course, properties would suggest perhaps ones with more welfare content, like the sand measure or the geometric mean, but we can talk about that at a later time. I want to mention to you there is a way of incorporating all the horizontal discussion in this exact framework. Horizontal inequality of uh, inequality and inequality of opportunities. You can take an inequality measure, standard inequality measure, and apply it to a smooth distribution. You get rid of inequalities within groups, and all you have left is inequalities across groups. Okay? So that means that the standard becomes an inequality adjusted mean, but where you only have that part of inequality that is across groups and not within groups. So that's kind of the standard way Chico Ferreira has been pushing forward, um, and, and others, of course, have been looking at this question. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, although between group inequality has a heck of a lot more salience, it, it's really quite tough to. Uh, implement this across countries because countries are so different. Hence, your comments are just right on the mark. Thank you. Multidimensional. When we talk about inequality, it's not just income. It's a lot of other things. But when you try to measure multidimensional income, it's tough. And so I can only mention one example that uh, has been done. Uh, take the Human Development Index, which is a mean of means. The Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index is a geometric mean of geometric means. Subtract one from the other and divide by the, the one, and you have an inequality measure, actually. But it's built up on so many assumptions, it's really, really tough to say this is something that could survive scrutiny. Alternatively, we could focus on deprivations and look within each of the multidimensional you know, dimensions and say, look, you're deprived, you're not, and then aggregate that way. It's quite easier to do so. So aggregating deprivations or attainments across dimensions can be done. All you need for that is a cutoff. And then the kicker, which is the value for each deprivation, what it really means. You construct a distribution of deprivations or attainments. Let's focus on attainments. And it's how many attainments do you have? How much attainment do you have? And apply a poverty measure, a poverty gap measure, and you get the M0, which is the adjusted headcount ratio, which has been used behind the multidimensional poverty index by the UN. Alternatively, and this has been applied by Mexico, Colombia, and so forth. It has an interesting property that you can disaggregate it across all possible population levels. You can disaggregate it across dimensions. It's extremely helpful to be able to do those things for development goals at multiple levels. It measure, um, you have a measure of the base given by what's been done here. Unfortunately, measures of size and spread are tough to obtain. They haven't been obtained. They could be obtained, though, and I outline a way of doing so. But since my time is up, I'm going to say this is work in progress. There will be a side event in the General Assembly, which is on multidimensional poverty. And the book is at this HTTPS for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Um, I told you we were going to start with the simple intuitive and become sort of move down the line towards the more complex. That's, that's all I'm going to attempt to say about that presentation. Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our next speaker, Nora Lustig. Uh, Nora is a non-resident fellow here at the Center for Global Development, but uh, her day job is as a professor of Latin America economics at Tulane University. She's also the director of the Commitment to Equity Project, a research initiative 
focused on assessing the impact of fiscal policy on inequality and poverty in Latin America. Nora, the floor is yours. Thank you. And where is my PowerPoint? There. Okay. All right. I wanted to make a comment at the beginning that I'm really delighted that inequality has become so mainstreamed as part of the discussion. For those of us who have lived a little longer, we know that uh, decades ago you could go to jail in some of the countries if you worked on inequality because it was considered to be a radical, probably a communist, a terrorist, and so uh, you would probably be in jail if you worked on, on inequality issues. So we've come a long way to make this uh, something that people are able to discuss reasonably well, and uh, hopefully it's also going to be reasonably discussed within the political process at the, at the UN. Uh, what I'm going to do actually is I'm not going to discuss the advantages of disadvantages of all the measures of inequality that were uh, presented so far. Um, I have actually another one that I consider sort of my favorite, what happens to the top 1%. Uh, you know, sort of we are the 99, even if we are above the median of uh, India, we're still part of the 99, I think, everybody here. But what I'm going to be talking about is something else that I think that what we need to measure is how much does the government, does the state, the society, if you think that the government is representative of what the uh, what society wants, do to change the inequality that is produced by the market. Do, what does the government do to change the poverty that is produced by the market? And one of the most powerful instruments to achieve this is fiscal policy, taxes and transfers. So I think we need to begin to think about, well, what's going on there? And try to track that, which all the measures that were here, you know, we can use them all. And we can even not use inequality and just look at poverty, which is what uh, uh, Martin, I think, is going to argue. Look at this. This is, sorry, the change in the genie, in percentage points, when you compare what happens between a market income genie versus one that happens after direct income taxes and direct cash transfers. You know, the European countries, as we know, do a lot of redistribution, and there you can see it. And we have added now the U.S. and Brazil. This is data. The, the, the data from Euro comes from Immerval and all this other data comes from a recent paper that uh, some of my uh, colleagues at uh, Tulane students, actually, and Tim Smeeting and I wrote comparing the U.S. and Brazil. And look, Brazil does little redistribution. And by the way, the size of the government of Brazil is not small. It actually competes with the size of the government of these other countries. Primary spending over GDP in Brazil is about 40%, very similar to what happens in Europe. So Brazil, in terms of income redistribution through money that goes to the pocket or that takes away, does relatively little. So now let me show you a comparison, and this is part of the project that uh, Lawrence just mentioned, and I apologize, there's lots of people who've worked on this, all this, uh, all the citations are in the in the website that I invite you to look www.commitmentwiki.org, where we have been looking at a bunch of countries. Primarily, we start with Latin America, but now we're moving to other parts of the world with the World Bank. We're covering all the regions with pilots, and also uh, we're going to start maybe with some of the northern African countries with the African Development Bank. So we're moving to other regions, but I'm going to show you something about. Brazil, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. Okay, this again is the genie, forgive me, but we could do it with any other uh, <laughs> inequality measure. And this is market income before, you know, the state has come in. The first one, the top is Brazil. The others are Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. And you see they're pretty similar, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, right? Okay, so what happens when the government begins to apply direct taxes? Well, Brazil actually does a little more than the other countries because the Gini falls by two percentage points. Uh, Peru does very little. Uruguay and Mexico do about the same with the direct taxes, one percentage point. So what happens when you add direct transfers, cash transfers? Well, Brazil again looks pretty good, and so does Uruguay. Mexico, 
books in between, not so much, and Peru almost does nothing in terms of what happens to the inequality measure. Okay, so what happens when you add consumption taxes and consumption subsidies? Well, in terms of inequality, things begin to flatten. In Mexico, it was an outlier year. I think if they still had uh, subsidies to, uh, to, um, to gasoline, that was very important. Uh, so Mexico looks good because the subsidies were high, but they were temporary. But, you know, what we know, indirect taxes do little or increase inequality. And what happens when you add the monetized value of transfers in kind in education and health? A lot. And Brazil looks great, you know, sort of uh, inequality level after you add the imputed value of those transfers in kind gets close to, um, um, well, it gets closer to Uruguay. It started very far away and it begins to get closer. No? So there's some some important action taking place with the in kind. With all the problems that this has, I don't have time to, to go into that. Okay, you can use this to track what happens over time. And here, you know, I'm gonna show you the results from Mexico in two points in time of social spending. I'm not looking at the tax side now. So the first one is in 96, inequality was higher and the second one is in 2010. This is market income inequality. As um, Nancy showed earlier, inequality declined in Mexico and in many other countries in Latin America. Okay, but uh, so what, how much was uh, happening also on the redistribution side if you ask cash transfers? You see that disposable income fell by one percentage point in 2010. In, the, in 96, there was nothing. Progresa didn't exist, although it existed as a pilot, Santiago, because that's before Progresa was launched. So you begin to see the impact of the implementation of the uh, cash transfer uh, program on a massive scale. And then, you know, when you add the imputation of uh, the transfers in kind, you also see that Mexico has been making progress. And that's because leaving aside quality, I know we have, but let's start by measuring quantity. We can move on then to quality. I'm not saying that we should, but you can see that what's happened is that access to education and health has become much more widespread at the bottom in Mexico. That's what happened in those years. Okay, so that's, that's very good. And you know, you, uh, you can calculate how much by a very simple, not, I don't call it decomposition, it's a disaggregation. You measure the change in the Gini after the FISC, and before the FISC, and in the case of Mexico, about 12% of what happened between 96 and 2010, about 12% is attributable to a more redistributive action. So you can then track that. And I think that's what I like to propose to see in the future. Finally, I wanna show that this is also important for poverty because I'm gonna show you the comparison of Mex Brazil, Mexico, Peru, not Uruguay, because it was you know, last getting- Last minute, yeah. Last minute. Exactly. So these are the poverty rates with the $4 a day PPP, uh, which is similar to what uh, countries use as their national poverty rates. So I'm using that uh, instead. And the first one is Peru, the uh, second one is Brazil, the third one is Mexico, okay? And so what happens with the taxes, direct taxes? Well, in some cases, not much because Direct taxes are not paid by, by low-income people, but in Brazil, it looks like they are paying some of the low, um, some of the low-income people actually pay direct taxes. What happens when you add the cash transfers? Brazil looks great. It has Bolsa Familia, it has BPC, lots of redistribution. So what happens when you add consumption taxes? Look what happens to Brazil. It turns out that the Brazilian tax system taxes more the basic consumption basket than uh, other goods, and so it's very anti-poor. Uh, and they can't undo it because it's a mixture of state level taxes and federal taxes, and it's a political nightmare to try to reform that. So in a way, they have to use the cash transfers to undo the bad things that the consumption taxes are doing. So this, I mean, by the way, we don't measure poverty imputing the transfers in kind because we don't think you can go to that extreme. 
But this also, again, would be something that we want to monitor over time and monitor the whole story, not just, I mean, most of the studies will end at disposable income. We want to see also what consumption taxes. Consumption taxes, remember, when you go back to inequality, we didn't do much to Brazil. It just increased by one percentage point. So you cannot do the tracking just for inequality. You have to do it for poverty as well. So what I propose is no matter which one you choose, we can do away with the Gini, Palma, Median, Harmonic, whatever. Right. Let's do it pre-FISC, post-FISC, over time. Thank you. Nora, thank, thank you very much for a very lucid and provocative presentation. Um, our final speaker on this panel is Martin Revalian. Um, Martin is one of the world's leading authorities on poverty measurement. Uh, he's currently a professor at George Washington University and was previously the director of the research department at the World Bank. And among his many accomplishments and contributions there was proposing what we all now know and love as the $1 poverty line uh, in 19. 90. Um, I said we were going to go from the simple to the more complex. I think we have a little bit of a twist in the tail here uh, from Martin. Martin, do you propose to speak from down there? Yep. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, inviting me to this event. And it's so far, interesting. I'm not going to say anything very complex. I'm going to just talk a bit about how should we think about inequality in the context of the post-2015 discussions about development goals. So I'm going to steer us back to that topic that uh, Rebecca started with. Um, and it's, I'm going to be a little bit um, philosophical about this, but I, I think there's something missing here. And I'm certainly not going to talk about how best to measure inequality, because I don't think that's the point at all. Um, Rebecca said, told us about how the, diffi the difficulties that the uh, UN high-level panel has had in agreeing on um, any kind of inequality reduction goal. Um, and on reflection, that's not at all surprising. I'm not in the least bit surprised that they had a, little, a lot of difficulty with that agreement. And I don't think it's a simple matter of political economy or ideology even. Uh, inequality is just not like poverty or infant mortality. Poverty, we want to go to zero. That's a view we have now. Actually, 200 years ago, we didn't think that. But Today, there's a consensus around that. Infant mortality, we want it to go to zero. There is absolutely no reason we want inequality to go to zero. Inequality can be too high and it can be too low from the point of view of our development goals. And neither philosophy nor economics gives us any mandate or any argument that for unqualified, of unqualified emphasis or support for the idea of just unambiguously reducing inequality. It's a, far, a very much more nuanced argument. Uh, if you think about uh, Jeremy Bentham and the utilitarians, um, uh, many people following Bentham, but uh, leave that aside, they created a, a, a beautiful, conceptually beautiful case for believing that in a very qualified way that inequality of incomes was undesirable under certain conditions amongst homogeneous people. Heterogeneity in needs would change that dramatically, but it was inequality in incomes. It wasn't inequality of utility. And it was a very qualified case. And it certainly didn't say that inequality could just go to zero if the mean was going to change as well. That brings in the whole, all the debates about incentives. I think incentive arguments are exploited by the right and overemphasized greatly in discussions about policy. But at your peril, ignore incentives. Do not ignore incentives. The, the, uh, that, uh, the arguments ag against uh, the idea of a society with virtually zero inequality or forcing inequality too low, the incentive arguments are compelling. I don't think they're compelling about a lot of the, w the ways in which they're used in discussing social policy these days, but don't ignore them. Um, the other argument, that you could, the other brand of philosophy, if you like, that we can draw on is, is the contractarian approach, John Rawls and so on. Now, here again, the arguments, the, the, the sort of libertarian arguments, are, are very nuanced. I mean, John Rawls is absolutely happy with inequality as long as it benefits the poor. His focus is very much inequality is fine. It has to, that's the diff, what he called the difference principle or maximin. Inequality is acceptable as long as poor people benefit. It's unacceptable if it hurts poor people. And I think I'm very sympathetic with that. I'm certainly actually not a utilitarian. I'm much more a Rawlsian. Uh, in recent times, we've got John Roman. We've got a series of philosophers, including very prominent philosophers on the left, 
uh, Jerry Curran, for example, um, who have come up with, a, with another argument about inequality, which essentially says that uh, inequality, of circ inequality stemming from unequal circumstances is undesirable, but inequality stemming from effort is something we shouldn't care about. So again, a very qualified view. Um, that's led to a, a, an agenda for equality of opportunity, which I think is very important, and, and Rebecca mentioned this. This is actually the space. So inequality, put it this way, inequality fails the consensus test. Inequality of outcomes. Very clearly, we are not, it's not imaginable we could get a consensus for good reasons that inequality of outcomes is, is unambiguously undesirable. All right. We could get that consensus with equality of opportunity, and I think it's, it's not far from, from reach. But I want to sort of put a bit of a wet blanket on that as well. I mean, just to, to, to make sure we're not buying something, buying more than we want. Um, I think we can reach agreement, but there are also some issues. I find it absolutely unimaginable, if I think about it, that any civilized society would ignore inequalities, extreme deprivations that stem from mistakes that people made, bad choices. I, I think it would always be inhumane. If you can imagine that such a society, a society which only redressed or only addressed inequalities opportunity, inequalities stemming from unequal, from disadvantages of birth, disadvantages of circumstances, caste, race, where you're born and so on. Enormously important, but no society could ever ignore inequalities of outcomes. Uh, and I think that was echoed earlier on. There's also a deep identification problem that, that is just getting ignored too much, I believe, in the discussions of inequality of opportunity. And this, I think, is something that I hopefully will come up in continuing discussions about development goals. Um, that's about behaviour. Behaviour in, in inevitably intervenes between circumstances and outcomes. And there's no way of getting around that. That means that circumstances, they influence behaviours, they rarely dictate um, outcomes. Circumstances are things which interact with behaviours to determine the outcomes we see in the, in the world around us. That means that there's always scope for individual responsibility. Anything we see, any outcomes we see, we can see and it, something due to circumstances and we can see something due to individual responsibility. The logic of opportunity egalitarianism can thus slip very easily into blaming poor people for their poverty and excusing rich people for their, for their success on the grounds of some claimed effort they have made. And we actually see this repeating. It's one of the reasons, unfortunately, one of the reasons why we have an emerging consensus around inequality opportunity on both the left and the right. The right can be very happy to advocate anti-opportunity egalitarianism because they can see all kinds of efforts that explain their, their why they're in the top one, why some of them, for example, are in the top 1%. Uh, you can make the arguments, and, and you're going to have those arguments, and that, that, that if, if we are going to achieve that consensus around inequality opportunity, that's going to be, that's going to be happening. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of a qualified view on that, but I want to just uh, finally point to a couple of things. Even if we agree, suppose we can get to a point on equality of opportunity as the goal. Two further conditions need to be established before we, we, we go ahead with thinking of that in, 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 in the context of our development goals. And neither of these conditions has actually been established, neither, and neither of them being discussed. And that's the weirdest thing here, and I haven't heard a mention today. Two conditions. First, we need to establish that existing goals put too little weight on inequality. I haven't heard any mention of that. We have a whole bunch of MDGs, and very rightly, the high-level panel is, is respecting them, and we should move ahead on them. But please show me, how are they underweighting inequality? Every one of the MDGs depends on inequality. It's not independent. Distribution influences our progress against poverty. It influences our progress in health and education. Every single one of the MDGs, I would argue, is accountable in part to inequality. So what we have to ask ourselves is, how are the MDGs underweighting inequality? And we have to be very specific about that. If we're going to put up a new inequality agenda, we've got to be very clear on what it is that the existing MDGs are missing. Second condition, we have to establish that to correct that thing that's missing, the best thing to do it is an inequality measure. Logically, we've got to have two conditions. We've got to establish that inequality is missing from the existing goals. And secondly, we've got to establish that the solution, the correction, is to add an inequality measure. That's not obvious at all. So going back to poverty, one of my favourite topics. Um, 
Okay, I, I'm fully accept now. I didn't uh, 10 years ago, but now I'm fully accept on the basis of the research that's happened that absolute inequality measures put too little weight on an important aspect of distribution to do with social inclusion, to do with your, 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 your ability to participate in the society around you, at the society around you. There's a relativist concept in inequality that I think is valid. And, I, and I've learned that from the research, not, certainly not just my own, research in many disciplines as well. So I'm willing to accept that. That means that I can identify something in an absolute poverty measure that is missing and it's about inequality. What's the solution? It's not to add an inequality measure. It's to measure relative poverty better. And I would argue, in fact, our poverty MDGs, a really good positive step would be keep the absolute poverty agenda, focus on poverty by an international standard, but also by the standards of the country or the society in which you live in, and keep both hand in hand. Mm -hmm. That's the solution, not to add inequality measure. So, in conclusion, just two, point, two points, and I think just to reiterate, reiterate them. Um, high inequality can, can slow progress against development. I have no doubt about that. Low inequality can also slow progress against uh, progress toward our development goals. No doubt about that either. Uh, but that does not constitute a case for adding an inequality measure on its own as, as a goal in itself. If you don't, if I'm not convinced you so far, let's make another argument. Okay, growth, GDP, old-fashioned GDP growth does not, is not one of the MDGs. It looks like it's missing too. Should we add that? If you think that you should add inequality to the existing MDGs, surely, logically, you've got to argue, well, I've got to add growth too. We're not going to do that. That would be a step backwards. And secondly, even if we do agree, we've got to think very carefully about why inequality is undervalued, and how what we do to change that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Barton. Um, I'm curious, uh, how many people walked in this room thinking that an inequality indicator was probably a good idea and are now less sure, having heard Martin? Is there anybody who... Two, an indicator, greater focus on measurement of inequality, either post-2015 or just in general. Greater focus on measuring inequality is a good idea. Is it, is and, it, and now your confidence is a little bit shaken. I saw, put your hand up. It's got to allow a little bit for lags, no? Allow a little bit for lags. I mean, so you know, so six, ten, only six of you, mine in, was shaken in five by seconds, that. five seconds, I got four extra hands. I mean, let's, let's wait about a minute. <laughs> Absorption. Well, well, we'll ask again at the end of the panel. Um, I want to ask the panel members, because we, we began with Nancy putting forward a very, I think, simple and intuitive measure, something that I can pretty much understand, not being an economist. Uh, we moved in, I think, somewhat greater degree of complexity with Alex's proposal for a ratio, uh, the Palma, and then we got to uh, James, quite complex issues about measurement, and then Nora is saying it doesn't really matter which indicator you choose, but you ought to look at the impact of physical transfers on that. And then Martin said, bollocks at all. We really shouldn't be measuring this stuff. Um, I want to know if anybody on the panel, did your do you have a, a response to Martin's argument? I think he's the outlier yes. here. Would somebody like to respond to that? Nancy. I, I'm not sure it's a response, but I, I would maybe ask Martin to comment on two points. One is some of what you were saying can, I can easily agree with and others too in terms of having an inequality goal. At the same time, and this is my second point, it doesn't convince me that we don't need an indicator uh, of some kinds of inequality, including outcomes on income, wealth, consumption. Fundamentally, answering your point about existing goals put too little weight, you know, that that would be an additional condition, what's missing is the political implications uh, of inequality as perceived at the country level um, and changes in inequality at the country level over time, by measuring that, using it as an indicator of something, I, I think we, we gain somewhere. Uh, sorry, it's not a very coherent point, but two points, goal versus indicator. An indicator because of some politics that are quite salient 
Um, and this refers back to Rebecca's issue of fairness and what people see and perceive and are concerned about. Do you want to seek clarification or respond, Martin? Okay. Um, I have absolutely no worries about measuring inequality or monitoring inequality. We do that. I, I, I do that. Other people in this panel, we, we work on this. I have no problems with that. I'm talking about inequality, establishing inequality in the context of the dis current discussions about development goals. That's the that's a big difference. There's no we, you know, quarrel about monitoring inequality. Inequality is, is as I've emphasized, is, 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 is instrumentally, instrumentally important to achieving any, develop, any decent development goal that I've ever heard about. And so the monitoring is important. Similarly, we should monitor economic growth. No problem about that. Absolute agreement. I don't understand uh, your, your second point, Nancy. Need two additional conditions, but I think that applied to the question of a goal, not an indicator. And I didn't. The existing goals put too little weight on inequality. Would be one condition. I don't. I think that's not met, as you as you imply, and that the best correction is another measure. Uh, yeah, I think it's leaving out. The, the fact that in many achievement of other goals is endogenous in many societies to the level of inequality. So I think we're close to agreement on the need to measure it. Um, I want to pose a sort of related question that has to do with really Nancy and Alex's presentation. And um, as a non-economist, I'm drawn to these because it seems to me that inequality is especially a concern for the poorer people among us and that the genie is totally non-intuitive. And if we're going to have a public discussion about this, then choosing some kind of measure that poor people could understand is a good idea and making that be the focus of policy, whether it's the median or the palma or some other simple measure. And I'm wondering if people, is that a fair sense of consensus that we'll leave the genie to the professional economists and then use something more intuitive Gen for Ginny everybody else or not? extremely intuitive. Please, somebody. Uh, Nora. Yeah, I mean, you, you can go. But I, I just wanted to say something also, if I may, uh, to the first uh, uh, question you posed. I think we, at least I do agree that it doesn't make sense to have a goal in terms of reducing inequality by X percent so we get to point two, like the Czech Republic. But I do think that we can begin to think about what are the sources of the existing inequality and if they came from processes that are dysfunctional, either socially, politically, economically, and that's the way I would approach the discussion in terms of uh, dealing with the, the goal. The goals would be looking at the processes, and I think it's good to have that discussion. Second, the genie actually is one of the most intuitive. Uh, we, we, you know, no, none of us, we, we don't have time, I don't know if you brought it, the Lorenz curve. The Lorenz curve. Oh, uh, but Lorenz spells L O R. No, but I mean, that's. that's you know. I, I can spell it. I'm not sure I can explain I just, I it. I can't that's do this. Okay. This is not acceptable. Look, just imagine all the incomes in this room. Let's calculate all the absolute differences between all your incomes and average it and rescale it a bit. But that's all we're talking about with Ginny. Averaging all the absolute differences. Absolute differences, you understand? You know, some person's got an income of 100, other person got an income of of 20, the absolute difference is 80. Take all those absolute differences, average them, and, and just rescale it to get it nice between zero and one. That's it. I would um, like to see the Lorentz curve. Uh, uh, Alex, do you, do you want to do you want to respond to that? I think y your argument is based in part on choosing something that is intuitive to perhaps a wider number of people. Sure. I mean, I agree in a sense that the genie is intuitively clear, but on the other hand. I could have explained the Palma to you seven times while Martin was struggling through what a Lorenz curve is. And if we're thinking about um, targets that will hold government to account, then it strikes me that anything that you have to explain before you then get to the number, and then you say, and this year it's gone from 0.3 to 0.4, let's say. And that means, oh, hang on, let me go back to my diagram and show you a line that's a bit lower than the last line I showed you, and then you'll understand you know, why this is important and what the policy implications are. It's, it's kind of lacking in some fundamental sense. Yes, there is an intuitive clarity, but I don't think it goes towards being the type of measure on which governments are held accountable. 
Um, we've got about 15 more minutes in this panel. Then there will be not really a break, but an opportunity to stretch, get coffee if you need to, go to the restroom. Um, I want to open it up to the floor for questions or comments. Um, I see Mead over in the back. And uh, I'll take these first three. Mead and then the woman, sort of, you know who you are. And then the gentleman behind her. We'll take those three, and then we'll do one more round after that. I found Martin. Please identify uh, yourself. Yeah, my name is Mead Over. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. And I found Martin's uh, two questions to us to be actually quite challenging. Uh, first, what's wrong with the current set of MDGs that we need to add um, the, uh, uh, the inequality index? What, what is it not currently measuring? And why uh, would, do we need to add it? So one thing that strikes me that it's not currently measured and this is something we haven't really talked about because maybe because it's uh, one of the reasons why inequality used to be politically incorrect. But the Gini and other, and especially the Palma, capture something about plutocracy, right? And I think all of us feel uncomfortable about uh, um, the fairness of a society in which a very small number of people are totally above the law. They have the resources to essentially buy the system. And I think all of us feel that inequality measures uh, really get at that to some degree. And I think this is part of what perhaps Nancy was referring to when she was talking about the politics. Um, and I would argue that this is something that the other measures of MDG just don't get at. But in answer to Martin's second question, I'm not sure that we need the inequality measure to get at that uh, because some of the problems with having all those plutocrats uh, could be measured with if we had a good corruption index, and some of them could be measured by possibly by measures of political um, political participation. Some of them could be measured even by uh, uh, indices of the of the middle class. Some of them can be measured by uh, measures of the degree to which people have fair and equal access to health and education systems. So I'm not sure I can answer Martin's second question by affirming that we would need the inequality measure. But nevertheless, I, I wondered if any of you have comments about this plutocracy, the, the, the uh, evils of plutocracy, and whether you should be worried about that. Uh, Mead, thank you very much. If you want to pass it forward, the thanks very much. Uh, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Amisha. I work at Mission Measurement, which is a social impact consulting firm. I've just come back from three years in Brazil, uh, where I did quite a lot of research on policy economic policy, basically. Um, and my big question is around that. Like, what can governments use from inequality indicators that will make things better? Because surely that's the point of the Millennium Development Goals. So. Misha, was that it? Uh, Misha, thank you. And the gentleman behind Amisha. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Diego Palacios from the United Nations Population Fund. Uh, I would like to refer to the high-level panel report, and I agree that it doesn't incorporate a goal or a proposal in terms of inequality. However, in the report, there's a small reference to the fact that the goals and targets will not be considered completed if the lowest and the poorest populations and segments will not achieve those goals and targets. I would like to get a view from, from you in terms of this uh, idea, and would that be feasible, and will that respond to the perhaps the last uh, um, panelist in terms of the need or not to have an inequality measurement? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I think it was Mr. Palacio's question about the high-level panel's recommendation to say the goals are not achieved unless they are achieved for all groups and the bottoms of all of those groups, whether that's a good substitute for inequality monitoring. Um, Mead, um, I'll leave people if they wish to reply to that. And uh, Alicia's question, I think, was really about instruments, and I think Nora's remarks are very much along those um, lines. But um, I'm not, for this round, going to ask everybody to respond. But if you heard something in particular that you want to respond to, um, please maybe indicate that to me, and then I'll take another round of questions. Nancy, and then Martin. I think it's a nice point that Mead makes about plutocracy, but I think it's too narrow uh, a way of describing the question of whether 
inequality um, is not only an outcome but an input to bad other outcomes in that you can have a lot of non-plurocratic politics in which it is still the case that because of high inequality, something is going wrong. Let me use the example. I started sort of making a face. Nora knows about this. When she showed the value, the, uh, the addition to the real income or the reduction in inequality in Brazil or Mexico associated with in-kind services supplied by government. If you actually try to look at the micro level at how people seem to be valuing those services, what you find is that even people who are in the group Rebecca described as vulnerable, they have escaped poverty but they're really not income secure, not what I would say and others would say is middle class. They do not value those services at anything like the cost that is attributed to them per household. Well, how do we know that? Because even when they are only getting, uh, having consumption or income per capita of four or five dollars per person, they are opting out and they're spending a lot of their private market income on, on, on private services. That's not because of plutocracy. That's because the rich have found a way through the system to ensure that more money goes to the levels of education and the kinds of schools in the neighborhoods that they want. And we're suffering something of that in this country as well. Uh, Martin, you had to come in? Okay, um, I think um, just two, two points. Um, I, I developed in the, through the agonies that we went through at the World Bank last year on the, on the bank's goals, and Jaime Saavedra is here, he knows how much agony he and I went through, and, and others, many at the bank. And I actually came out of that not very happy with the solution, actually, but, but also quite respectful of the importance of goal setting, the importance of thinking clearly, conceptually about what you're doing. And why is it important? Because goal setting can really motivate action. It can motivate effort. I'm not sure you know, how, how successful we've been with the MDGs there, but I actually think it's quite, I actually learned that more than anywhere. anywhere. I learned that from working on China. Um, so I have a healthy respect for it. It has to be conceptually sound and it can't be muddled. It can't turn into, the, you can't turn it into what I call a dog's breakfast of goals. I mean, this is, it's got to be, we really think clearly about this and, and, and I'm not sure that we always do. Um, second point, um, Actually, the, in response to your comment, I think the, 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 the report, um, high-level power, high level panels report, that expression that leaving nobody behind is brilliant. I, I think that's terrific. That's a nice way of putting a really key point. It is exactly, almost exactly Rawls's difference principle, John Rawls, 1971, Theory of Justice, but expressed in a way, not even Rawls, one of the greatest writers I've known, uh, could, could, could caught it so well. That's really nice. Leaving nobody behind, meaning that no, but you know, we're not going to. If as long as there's poverty left in the world, we haven't finished the job. Poverty defined in whatever relevant dimension you identify. That's a very nice way of putting it, and I agree fully with it. Thank you, Martin. Um, I favored this side of the room. If there are questions on this side, um, we can take uh, one, two. We'll take those two last questions then. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Aracho Castro. I'm a, I'm a professor of public health in Latin America at Tulane University with Nora. And um, when I look at inequality in health, there are many indicators that have a limit. For example, life expectancy, there's a limit to it. Um, and healthcare utilization, there is a limit. It doesn't matter if somebody's going to a doctor every day if, if the person is doing well. So when we look at income, there's no top limit. So how does that skew when the measures of inequality? Should we, for measuring purposes, set a limit on, let's say, well, we're not gonna look at uh, people who are making more than a billion a year because um, it's gonna skew our understanding of how inequality has an impact in health and education and other uh, MDGs. So does it really matter that 
uh, there are 10 or 50 persons in one single country that are making that much income to understand those inequality processes. Um, Ms. Castro, just so your proposal is not to limit their income but to not include it in any calculations? So let's say, if we're not look I'm just randomly saying we're not going to look at uh, incomes above a certain level. We're just going to put them at the top. Take it out. Okay. To not, to not eliminating them but giving them a top value giving it a top value. So it, it doesn't show up as a benefit to the society beyond that point. No, no. To understand how inequality has an impact on MDGs and other indicators, it may not matter whether there are five or ten people who are making a huge amount of money. They make, let's say, more than one billion. So instead of saying they're making 2.5 billion or they're making 20 billion, we may say okay. they're making one billion just for measuring purposes. Okay, great. I think there was one other comment. And then, Rebecca, if you want to have another word before we end the session, you're certainly welcome to do so. Hi, my name is Jenny Russell. I work with Save the Children. And we've done quite a bit of research on the issues around inequality and feel very strongly that it should be included in the post-2015 framework. Um, I'm really interested in, in that provocative comment about there's really not a constituency for inequality. And I, you know, part of our job uh, as an NGO, I think, will be to create that over the next two years um, globally and uh, working with poor people's movements throughout the world. And uh, I'm really interested in your uh, personal views on putting aside the question of what should be the measurement and if there should be a goal, I'm interested in your personal views on uh, what could we, what's politically feasible uh, with member state negotiations over the next two years. Do, would the high-level panel uh, recommendation on disaggregated data uh, that would ensure that the bottom groups achieve the MDGs, do you believe that's politically fe feasible? Could we even be more ambitious? That's my question. Okay, terrific. Rebecca, did you want to add anything? Yes, yes, she does. I'm sorry. Can you bring the mic up, please? Mic up. Let, let me clarify several things. <laughs> One is that the zero agenda, yes, if you go to zero, so what is the inequality measurement that we need? beyond zero. The inequality measure we, we need when we go for a zero agenda is how the progress will be tracked between groups. Because you can progress at the beginning much more on the group that is part of your party or that is part of your ethnicity because a lot of the dynamics within the countries that are more stable or that are poorer or that have low income is precisely the very steep divisions that are not only about income inequality interacts, but is about the, the the inequality between groups, is uh, what ethnia they belong to, or etc. So when you are in the zero agenda, the important thing is to track progress, because you can be an unstable country when you only the first ten years or the first five years of the process you only go for the ones that are yours. And that's an important thing, how progress is measured, you know, and how the inequalities or difference between groups, even in the zero agenda, will be tracked. That, that's first, and that's an important point. It's, a, it's a, 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 a point in terms of governance, it's a point in terms of sustainability, it's a point in terms of conflict, because polarization can happen if you don't track progress in the period, even in the zero agenda. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's first. Second, I think that Nancy made a very, a very important point. You know, it's not only about, only about measurement, it's only about the perception. I really believe the tolerance to inequality has gone down. I'm not talking about zero inequality, but the tolerance to inequality has gone down. And that will affect the uh, the democratic <laughs> uh, platform for the countries of the world. 
I am not saying it's the same thing for everybody, but that's why I, you know, the, the high level panel that I think that it made a very good job actually, you know, is a, a including part part of this for what is coming next. You know, the governance issues will be present in the discussion of the platform because at the end, you know, it's, it's true what you say, Martin, in terms of, of poverty, but the, at the end, how you measure it will fix it. You know, if you continue with the 1.25, it's a decision. It's, it's not clear, you know, uh, or intuitive to, anybody, to everybody that that's, the one that you have to take. So it's true, you know, but but uh, if you include only 20% of the population and you have the other 50% very unhappy, you will have a problem in terms of the sustainability of the system that will in itself fight poverty or not. So I, I think that the, the political issue that has been brought to the table is, is not a marginal issue in terms of the dynamic that we have to follow. And, and thirdly, and I, I want to, to repeat that, I think that we can combine the um, horizontal inequality with the poverty one in the, in the measurement. That's what the high level panel proposed because in the, in the targets that won't be z the zero targets that are percentages, yeah, that you have to reduce what has happened in many countries in these MDGs is that you achieve the goal of reduction leaving behind groups that have not benefited at all from that improvement. And in Latin America, for example, where you have countries that have indigenous groups that are very small with respect to the total of the population, you can get to the target of reducing some percentages without touching them. And that's a problem that is not only <laughs> the uh, that's a problem of inequality that has to be considered in the agenda to follow. And I think that the NGOs can do a lot to raise, you know, the coalitions that we need to be able to include it in the right way. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do something a little different for wrapping up. I'm going to put each of our panelists on the spot and give them just 30 seconds. You can respond to something from the floor or you can have a parting thought, but really just 30 seconds and I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to start with Martin. You can restate your thesis or say something totally different, whatever you want to say or respond to a speaker. Martin, your 30 seconds has begun. I think it's not actually, just an important clarification, I don't think it's quite horizontal inequality that you're talking about. I think you're talking about inequality of opportunity in the, the John Roma sense and the way it's implemented in, in, in things. So it, it's not quite the same thing. But I think we need to, you need to be a bit clearer about it because uh, I think there's an objection could, could be raised. I've still my 30 seconds is done. And finally, on, on top censoring, um, I, I don't agree at all with top censoring in, in distributions. I think we underestimate incomes of the rich. It's really, we shouldn't be top censoring. I mean, make, making them lower than they already are. They're already lower. They're already measured lower than they really are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I agree. Right. I think that. Uh, the top sensor, and, and I also don't know why we need it in connection with the other dimensions. So I think the other dimensions could be measured by income groups. And then you know you could have goals in terms of saying, well, we don't want in the life expectancy to be X amount different, or you know we would like it to be the same. We would like, our goal would be the income mortality rate not to depend on, on income. I don't know, this is, the, but censoring the top incomes but only censoring. The fact that we use household surveys actually has led us to know very little about the concentration at the top. Because once you begin to use the data that has that information, which is primarily tax returns, and I invite you to visit the website by, by the top incomes group where Atkinson, PKP, okay. are, there you're gonna see that the top 1% captures a lot of income that we don't capture in all the work that we've been doing here with household service. Thank you. James. Yes, the disaggregation discussion was, I think, right on the mark. Uh, it's uh, interesting that it's a kind of a pairing with the uh, horizontal way of looking at it, but doing it from the outside, taking a measure and looking at each group and seeing how that measure compares to other groups. Uh, 
but for that you need good data, and data are missing in all this process, hasn't been mentioned much today. Uh, surely we need to have a concentration on that aspect before we get to anything else. And in particular, I would argue for uh, including in measurement uh, the jointness of distributions. That is, you, you're looking at individual people, and people have got deprivations in lots of different things at the same time. That's different than if one person has one deprivation or another. And we should have the data to be able to distinguish between those situations. So that's something that is missing from the current situation. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Alex. Um, thanks. No, I absolutely agree with that. Um, apart from including illicit financial flows, I think the best thing the high-level panel did was the data revolution and yeah. the disaggregation. I think if you say that you can't get beyond goals that are defined in terms of absolute need, then the best thing you can do is say that no target is met until each of these marginalized groups gets it partly because it gets you a little bit closer to dealing with inequality and partly because it generates the data. But, um, you know, I would argue that inequality is inherently not only instrumentally important. I think the work that Save the Children have done, particularly in the last year or so, has, has really shown the extent to which children's development is fundamentally affected by the inequality, regardless of their position in terms of absolute needs being met. And that should be, you know, that's, that's the gap, I would say, is, is missing and needs us to deal with. Nancy. First, I think there is a constituency for measuring inequality. There may not be a political constituency at the top, but Rebecca made clear there is a people's constituency. Second, I think what Nora said today is extraordinarily important, that any measurement of inequality is an indicator if it's not somehow making it possible to look at government effort to reduce high levels of inequality um, is kind of missing the point. And after all, the MDGs as goals were all about trying to make governments more accountable. Third, the top censoring issue. Notice that the median handles that very nicely. <laughs> Fourth, I think it's a big step in the end. I, I wish that the World Bank had come out at the 50th, not the 40th percentile which would have been the median, because I think everybody in the world can understand that easily. It's very accessible. If you, you know, how many times have you read in the last year that median wage in the U.S. has not risen? And it's a durable measure because it is used in the richest countries. And so, you know, I think we should all keep in mind that Nora has been asked to join the successor to the Sen Stiglitz Pitusi Commission. And that even if the World Bank and the UN and the MDG community doesn't deal with this question of inequality measurement, effectively, if we can get someplace, somewhere, and it might be the World Bank at the 40th percentile, that's a big step in the right direction. I wish it was relative to what's happening at the top, but we can do that anyway without the World Bank doing it, using the very easily available uh, aggregate national accounts measures of, of various aggregates. In the end, there's a public good out here that luckily just got mentioned, which is we need these household survey-based measures. Um, and one of the reasons we have medians now is because Martin and his team really worked hard putting together the PAFCALnet uh, and using it, you know, using all the household surveys and worked hard. Nora and others historic in the, in the last 20 years have worked hard. So that's the issue for us going forward, I think, is generating the public good so that more people can figure out what they want the measure to be and not expecting or relying entirely on an official uh, institution. Please join me in thanking our terrific panel members.